So the total of all the squared deviations is 96.1. We now divide that by 9, which is 10 minus 1. We have 10 observations. You divide by n minus 1 to get the variance. Now you may say, why divide by n minus 1? Why not divide by n? Uh, the explanation in statistics is when you have a sample, the variance in the sample will underestimate the variance in the actual population. And of course, you're calculating the variance of the sample, but you're using that as an estimate for the variance of the population. Okay, so that is why when you have a sample and you calculate the variance, you divide by n minus 1 and not by n. But of course, if you think that is the population, then you divide by n. So that's the idea of how to compute the variance. So the formula for variance, as I've just discussed, is if it's the population, it is uh, the sum of all the individual observations minus the mean, the population mean, square the deviation. So the numerator is really the sum of the squared deviations. The denominator is n, which is the population size. And of course, if it's the sample, then it's n minus 1 is the denominator. And of course, you sum up to n, which is the sample size. Now, in Excel, you can calculate the po population variance by var p and uh, the sample variance by var. And in R, there doesn't seem to be any specific thing for the population variance, and the variance is calculated as var. So those are the formulas for variance in Excel and in R. So what are the units of variance? Well, if you take a look at the formula for variance, so the individual observations, once again, let's say that we are talking about annual incomes, for example, of people. So the individual observations are dollars. So Xi is dollar. And as we've already discussed, the mean of incomes is also a dollar figure. So Xi is dollars, X bar is dollars. So Xi minus X bar is dollars. Now, when you square that, here, you get dollar square. And the numerator then is the sum of dollar square, so it's a dollar square is the, uh, is the units for the numerator. You divide it by n minus 1, which has no units. So ultimately, variance has units of dollar square. In our particular example, in general, variance has units, which is the square of the units in which the individual observations are measured. Now, this is a slight problem because you cannot really uh, have a good grasp of what dollar square is. Okay, so it's not an intuitively obvious thing. There's no way by which you can compare that with the base units in which things are measured. So that is why uh, units of variance has a problem. And sometimes you would find that it's a little difficult to use variance by itself because it doesn't compare very well to the underlying information itself. Therefore, it is standard practice to take the square root of the variance and that is what is called as the standard deviation. The good thing about standard deviation is that the units of standard deviation are the same as the units of the underlying measurements. So continuing our example of annual incomes, standard deviation will have a unit of dollar as well. Okay, so you will be able to say, well, the average annual income is $80,000 and the standard deviation is $10,000. So now you have an idea of how uh, the standard deviation compares with the underlying value. And later on, when we look at the normal distribution, we'll be able to understand this even better, uh, to give it a physical significance even more easily. Okay, so that's the idea of standard deviation. So here, I'm taking this concept further. Let's say we have two data sets, one which has a standard deviation of 100, another which has a standard deviation of 200. So now we want to ask a question, which of these has higher variability? Of course, you can see that I'm setting up a trick question here. Which of these has higher variability? Obviously, the one with standard deviation of 200 seems to have the higher variability. But we have to pause a little bit before we jump to that conclusion because we have to look at the variance or standard deviation in the context of the underlying population values. Now suppose the underlying values in the first case have a mean of 1000. So you have a standard deviation which is 10% of the mean, whereas in the second case, the underlying population has a mean of 100,000 and the standard deviation is only 200. 
So we can clearly see from this example that the variability of the first data set is actually a lot more than the variability of the second data set. So once again, what we are driving at here is that standard deviation by itself can sometimes not give us the whole picture and we should try and see the standard deviation in the context of the mean of the population. And therefore, there's another figure that is used, which is called the coefficient of variation, which is standard deviation divided by the mean. Okay, now the beauty of this is coefficient of variation will have no units because in the, if you continue this salary example, the standard deviation, the numerator, has dollars as the units. Mean also has dollars as the units. So when you divide the two, it becomes just a dimensionless number. And therefore, it is possible for us to compare the coefficient of variation of highly dissimilar data sets. So for example, you might be able to, you might have a set of heights of people and you might have a set of weights of people. And then you'll be able to compare these two and say heights exhibit a far greater variability than the weights or and so on. You won't be able to do that unless you standardize it by taking the coefficient of variation. Okay, because if something is measured in much higher units, then obviously the variations would seem to be much larger in that. However, when you divide it by the mean, it standardizes that variation. So coefficient of variation is also something that is useful to measure dissimilar or incommensurate figures. Okay, so coefficient of variation, the formula is sigma by mu for the population, where sigma is the population standard deviation and mu is the population mean. And for, for samples, coefficient of variation is in, it's indicated by CV hat. And the uh, formula is of course S divided by X bar. S being the sample standard deviation, X bar being the sample mean. Okay, so coefficient of variation is also a useful thing to consider when you're looking at dissimilar populations, dissimilar data, and you need to make some kind of comparison about the spread of such kind of data. And as I've already said, being unitless, uh, coefficient of variation is a useful figure, for, especially for comparison. Okay, so now we are moving on to uh, another topic. So you have a bunch of data, and here you've plotted X and Y. So let's say you've got a, a, a set of data which has two attributes, X and Y. Let's say height and weight, or price and profit, or something like that. So it's possible if you have two dimensions, it's possible to plot them uh, on a two-dimensional graph. Okay, so now what we are really talking about is how closely related are these two variables? What is the relationship between these two variables x and y? Now what exactly do we mean by relationship between variables? We can get more specific and say what we are talking about is how are they changing together? What do you mean by that? How are they changing together? Now, by looking at this diagram, we can generally see that larger x values are associated with larger y values. So very broadly speaking, we can say that as S incre x increases, y seems to be increasing. But of course, this is not absolute. This doesn't hold for every single data point. For example, this one has a very high x, but it has a lower y than something which has a lower x. Okay, so it's not always the case that higher x implies higher y, but generally you can see that there's a trend because the points are all uh, moving up, uh, moving to the moving above as we move to the right. Okay, so this is the idea that we are talking about of how variables are related. So what we are really saying is to what extent are the variables matching in step? To what extent does y increase when x increases and vice versa? To what extent and our X and Y marching together, lockstep behavior of X and Y. So that's, again, being uh, statistics and being mathematical, what we would like to do is not to simply say, well, uh, in general, there is a trend for them to move together and so on. We want to ascribe a number to that relationship so that we can compare when two variables are more closely related than two other variables are. 
Okay, and of course, we want to ask one more fundamental question. Why even look at relationships when there are two variables x and y? Why are we saying trying to connect the two things? Why can't we leave them alone? Well, the whole point is if we do find a relationship between them, if we can find some kind of a regular formula that connects x and y, not exactly, but approximately as is shown here, then we have the opportunity of using one to predict the other. Right? Because they are closely related, we may be able to say, since this has a higher value, we expect the other also to have a higher value. After all, in statistics and in data mining, one important aspect is prediction. We want to be able to predict the values. Right? So we may have historical data about x and y. And for the future, we may have only x. But our job might be to predict y. Okay. So now if we identify some kind of a relationship between x and y, then in cases where we have the x value, we might be able to use our understanding of the relationship to predict y. That's the whole reason why we even look at relationships between variables. And one nice way to do this is to do scatter plots in uh, our commander or in general scatter plots give an idea, a pictorial view of how two variables might be related. So here we have done a scatter plot of age versus the median value. Okay, and clearly what we can see is while there is no strong relationship, we do see that as the age increases, the median value tends to be lower, which is something we can expect, right? Because we are talking about houses, properties. The older the property is, the less its value is going to be, or the older a neighborhood is the less the general property, median property value of that neighborhood is going to be. That's what is being shown here. So this has been plotted with R commander and graphs and scatter plot. Uh, it's easy to do. You can load the data set in, in R commander and then use the graphs option, select scatter plot option and select the two variables age and median value. And then you see this kind of a relationship here. Now this is plotting not just the scatter plot is simply the plot of all the points. The various points in the data set, the 500 points in the data set, have all been point, plotted here. But they also try to give us an idea of the uh, trends by plotting certain other lines. Okay, So this line down here is the smooth line that uh, seems to indicate, broadly speaking, what the uh, general trend is. And then there are other lines which indicate the uh, the upper boundary and the lower boundary and so on. <coughs> For now, what we are interested in is really the scatter plot. Now, we can take this one step further. In our commander, there is the concept of a scatter plot matrix. So if you select graphs and select, uh, select scatter plot matrix, you can then select several variables, two or more variables, and R will then give you this kind of a matrix of scatter plots. Let's try and understand what this is doing. Uh, the variables on the diagonal are basically the variables I chose, age, crime, distance, and industrialization. Those are the variables which I chose to get the scatter plot matrix. Okay. Now, the, this is basically a, a, a line kind of a distribution of the properties. Okay. So what it's showing you is that uh, the, the, the scale on this particular thing is age. So what it's showing you is the distribution of the 500 data points by age. It's a frequency distribution. It's actually a probability distribution of these. Okay, so we clearly see that it is somewhat bimodal. There's a small peak here around uh, between 20 and 30 months, I presume. And then there's a much larger peak between 80 and 100. So there are a lot of homes in this range, 80 to 100 range, and uh, half of that number approximately between the 20 to 40 range, and the other values are, uh, some of the values are much lower, and a lot of values are in between, right? So on the diagonal, what you see is the uh, uh, hist histogram, you could say, of the chosen variables. So you see here, a crime, for example, is extremely skewed. As we saw earlier, in an earlier chart, we saw that crime was practically absent in most of the neighborhoods, but a few neighborhoods have crime, but of course it has a long tail, which is uh, a lot of values 
have uh, higher levels of crime, a lot of neighborhoods, but most of them have very low crime. This shows you the distance. So once again, you see that there, this is highly left skewed, uh, a right skewed distribution with the long tail on the right hand side, uh, but most of the things have low this. Industrialization shows a bimodal distribution with two solid peaks and the rest of the values distributed below these peaks. Okay, so the scatter plot matrix first of all shows you the distribution of the variables that we selected. In addition, what it shows you is a scatter plot of the various combinations of all these variables. For example, this scatter plot right here shows you the scatter plot of age plotted on the x axis, right? So since x axis age is along the x axis, so age is along this axis and crime is along this axis. Okay, so this is showing you the scatter plot of age versus crime. This is showing you scatter plot of age versus distance because you've got age on the x axis, distance on the y axis. Okay, and of course, there are two of every graph. For example, this is age versus crime, age on the x, crime on the y axis. This is the same graph, but age on the y axis, crime on the x axis. So you can see that is this graph is just a flipped version of this. So you could look at just one side of it. So let's say we look at the values at the scatter plots below the diagonal. Above the diagonal is just a repeat of the same values. Okay, so here you see the scatter plot of uh, industrialization on the y axis with age on the x axis and so on. So you can see that you can easily generate a matrix of scatter plots as well in our commander. It's easy to do that by just selecting graphs slash scatter plot matrix and then you select the variables you want to plot. You can select as many variables as you want, but if you have too many variables, then the, the scatter plot will take a little time to generate. That's not the problem, but even after it's generated, you won't be able to make much sense of it because they'll be just, uh, you know, they'll just be blotches of blacks, so you won't see much. So going beyond about five or six can make it useless. Okay, so here we are going to look at two scatter plots. So we've got two scatter plots. So once again, we want to ask the question, which scatter plot shows you greater degree of relationship between the two variables x and y? Now we may say that the picture on the right hand side shows greater relationship, shows a tighter relationship between x and y as opposed to the picture on the left hand side. In both the pictures, we can clearly see that there is a discernible trend. Higher values of x generally correspond to higher values of y. That is true of both of these. That is because you can see that the values are generally rising. But looking closer, we can probably say that this graph here shows you much tighter relationship. Why do I say that? I say that because you can see that the points here are all clustered much closer together along an imaginary line. The points are all much closer together along an imaginary line. Here also, while there is a trend, there are points which are a little further away. Okay, so in that sense, this chart here, uh, this scatter plot shows a much tighter association between the variables. So once again, what we want to do is to capture this intuition in the form of a number. So that we can say the relationship between these two variables is so much. The relationship between those two variables is so much. And one is greater than the other indicating a closer relationship. That's what we want to do here. And to do that, there are a couple of measures available. One measure is called the covariance. Obviously, what we are trying to do is to find out how two variables vary together. Therefore, covariance. The formula for covariance is xi minus mu x, yi minus mu y. Okay, or it could be x bar. So once again, it could be you could use either mu, which is the here we have written the formula formula for the population covariance. Okay, so xi minus mu x times yi minus mu y divided by n sigma of the things. Okay, so that's what is the Thing. So clearly what you can see is this shows you, the first term shows you the difference 
how far away from the mean a particular x value is and the second part shows you how far away from the mean a given y value is okay so for a given point we are multiplying its variation of the x and y points together we are summing it up dividing by n okay so now what you will see here is the numerator is positive when both x and y are on the same sides of their averages so for example if xi is greater than mu x and if yi is greater than mu y then obviously the two when multiplied together will give a positive value both of them are positive otherwise if one of them is above the average and the other of them is below the average then you'll get negative okay so that's the idea here so to give a clearer example of what's going on here so the formula is this suppose you have a set of scatter plots points like this okay so here and of course the axes are not zero here it's mu x and mu y okay so this point really represents the average value of x and the average value of y okay so the origin represents the average value of x and average value of y so clearly all the points here are above the x average and above the y average okay so they're above the y average above the x average so all of these points have positive xi minus mu i and yi minus mu y okay so they're all positive because every point here the, its x value is greater than the average of x and its y value is greater than the average of y so the numerator for each of these is positive here what happens is that for every value the x average the x value is less than the average of x and the y value is less than the average value of y right so therefore the term xi minus mu x is negative yi minus mu y is also negative so once again the product is positive okay so here what you're seeing is that each term contributes a positive value to the numerator and therefore if you see a picture like this it will result in a very high covariance because high values of x correspond to high values of y and low values of x correspond to low values of y so you end up with a very high covariance okay this is just showing the concept that we just discussed and therefore the overall result is that such a data shows high positive covariance on the other hand if you look at data like this you will be able to reason that for every value here this is uh, the x values here are the are lower than the x average the y values are higher than the y average right so one term is positive one term is negative so all of these have contribute negative to the numerator similarly all of these also contribute a negative value to the numerator okay so therefore this data set in effect has high negative covariance okay so the, the total result of all this is a high negative covariance so you can see here that covariance shows you uh, again a measure of how x and y are moving together either they are moving in the same direction or they are moving in the opposite direction if they are both moving in the same direction then you get a high positive covariance if they are moving in opposite directions you get a high negative covariance but when the values are scattered all over the place then the positive values negative values cancel out and you get a low covariance the covariance which is close to zero indicating that there is no big relationship a high positive relationship a high negative relationship both so strong relationship but a relation a relationship between a near zero a covariance near zero shows you a lack of relationship once again just like variance covariance also has units and therefore comparisons are problematic okay so we want to look for some other measure which is free of units or at least has the same units as uh, as the underlying value in this case we'll be going for something that is free of any units and therefore 
makes sense. So here we are looking at two different uh, sets of data, the same set of data really, but now we've put in a line. And of course, we want, we are looking for a measure that will uh, that will attach a number to the extent of relationship between two variables. It will attach a real number. We, earlier we had attached the number covariance, but we saw that it had a problem. So now we are looking for a different number. And the number we're going to look for uh, essentially will measure the degree or extent to which the points cluster near the line. So in this case, the points are much closer to the line than in this case, and therefore our number that we arrive at should indicate that. Okay, so closeness to the line is an indicator of a stronger relationship. And of course, we are looking here for a linear relationship, a straight line. Uh, here we have an example, another example. So we've got two charts once again. Which of them represents a closer relationship? Take a look, which of them represents a closer relationship? Now on cursory observation, it looks as if uh, the chart on the right hand side shows a much tighter relationship because the points are closer to the line. But we have to be careful because this is a trick question. And essentially, this is an illusion because if you look at the y-axis scale, the scale is actually highly compressed here. Here, this, it's the same data. It's exactly the same data, but I just created this chart with the scale on the y-axis enlarged to a much higher number. So this one goes all the way uh, up to 800, whereas this one was going only up to 350. Naturally, the points on the y-axis tend to cluster close down and physically they appear because both the charts are of the same size overall. And therefore, all the points appear much closer to the line, but this is an illusion. Okay, so we cannot go strictly by visual appearance here. Okay, so this was a trick question. They are the same, but different scale. So we need a more objective measure. And that objective measure, which is widely used, is what is called as the correlation coefficient. The formula for the correlation coefficient, one formula for the correlation coefficient is this. So once again, we are talking about R, which is the correlation coefficient for the uh, sample. And it's one by uh, n minus one times this. Okay, let's understand each of the terms carefully. So we are saying, we take every point one to n. So each point is x, y. Okay, so we are summing the points one to n. And we have the average x bar and y bar. So average of x, average of y is known. So the first term here, what it's showing us is, xi minus x bar divided by the standard deviation of x, which is we are saying, well, how far away from the mean is a particular observation? And we are dividing that by its standard deviation. Okay, so in other words, this is saying how many standard deviations away from the mean is uh, away from the mean is this x quantity. Similarly, this is measuring how many standard deviations away from the mean is this y quantity. Okay, now this is slightly different from the covariance. In covariance, we did not standardize the value by dividing it by the standard deviation. Okay, in fact, let's go back and take a look at the covariance formula. In that, we did not standardize it by dividing by the standard deviation. See here, we didn't standardize it. We just took the absolute deviation from the mean. And therefore, uh, that is why this tended to have units, because we were taking the absolute deviation, and therefore, uh, each one has its own unit. So for example, if x is income and y is height, then the units here are, you know, uh, the centimeter dollars or something like that, which is very difficult to interpret. Okay. And also, uh, you know, high values will tend to pull it in one direction or another direction because it's not standardized, which is why the co correlation coefficient is something that is much better. And here what we are seeing is for every value, we have now standardized it by saying how many standard deviations away is it from a given value. Okay, so that uh, is a much, much more objective solution to the problem. So for every value we take, we take the product of its uh, distance from the mean for each of the components. We add them all up and divide by n minus one. And that is a correlation coefficient. Now it so happens that Correlation coefficient can be a value from minus one to one. Minus one indicating a high negative correlation, which means when one is increasing, the other is decreasing, meaning when x has high values, y has low values, 
and when x has low values y has high values that is x and y are moving in opposite direction and a correlation coefficient uh, closer to 1 will indicate that it's the other way that x and y are both moving in the same direction and a correlation coefficient of 0 indicates any lack of linear relationship once again we are only talking about linear relationships here not about any other kinds of relationship okay so here we are seeing that this is basically measuring the number of, number of standard deviations from the mean. In statistics, we also refer to that as the z-score, which we will not be using in this course much. Okay, And as I have already said, correlation coefficient is always between 0 and 1. So this has no units as we have already seen. Uh, each of them has got standardized, so it has got no units and therefore it is great for comparisons. Some examples of correlation coefficients. Uh, so here we see here correlation coefficient of uh, this one actually has a correlation coefficient of minus one. I made a mistake in putting zero point one. Uh, this is exactly minus one because all the points lie on the straight line, and it's minus because it's sloping the other way. This is sort of, you know, when x is high, y is low, and when x is low, y is high, but the points are not all falling on the line. Therefore, this will have a correlation coefficient lying between minus 1 and 0. This will be minus 1. So the 0 0.1 is wrong. Uh, this, of course, will have a correlation point which is co coefficient which is positive because high x values and high y, y values co occur. But the values are not falling exactly on the line, so therefore this is going to be between 0 and 1. It's going to be positive. This will have exactly 1 because all the values are falling exactly on the line. And this, when the points are all scattered all over the place, the correlation coefficient will be close to 0. In this case, actually speaking, I cannot say it's 0 because uh, I have to show some points in the other quadrants as well for it to be really 0. In this case, there is still probably a small positive correlation coefficient because uh, at least high values are somewhat correlated with high values. But you get the idea here. This is showing you some more examples of correlation coefficient. As we've already seen, when everything falls on a line, it's plus one. When everything almost falls on a line, it's still high, but it's not one, it's 0.8. And when the trend sort of keeps going, uh, worse and worse, then you see that the correlation coefficient becomes slower, lower and lower. When points are completely scattered at zero, and when it starts turning to the other side, it becomes negative. Okay. So, but anything which where all the points fall on a straight line are going to be uh, exactly one, zero, or minus one when everything falls on a straight line. And here you see some other things when the scatter is it's much more severe so even though there appear to be appears to be some kind of a relationship you know there is some regularity still the correlation coefficient is zero because the correlation coefficient only measures the strength of the linear relationship and in this third row there are no significant linear relationships at all and therefore all of them end up with a correlation coefficient of zero Okay. So this is what we were just talking about. Correlation coefficient and covariance both measure the strength of linear relationship, not anything else. So for example, here you've got two variables x and y which are related in a perfectly predictable fashion. Now you can easily plot a quadratic curve and then predict y exactly given any x values. However, if you calculate the correlation coefficient for this, we'll get zero because there is no linear relationship. So we have to be careful. Um, of course, generally in statistics, we tend to look for linear relationships because they are easily calculated and so on. But of course, in the real world, there are lots of nonlinear relationships and the correlation coefficient will not help us in those.